Hi Chapel family and friends. I am so glad that you are watching this video because it means that you have an interest in learning more about our next trip to Israel. And that will be in 2022, November 7th through 18. Of course, that's all in the Lord's hands, isn't it? So I love to ask the question, why go to Israel? You know, in my past, I thought, oh, I don't need to go to Israel. But when I did for the first time, like, wow. So why go to Israel? Well, God's word will come alive. We will see where David ruled, where Jesus walked, where the disciples fished. We'll see really the smallness of the land. So we leave the chapel by chartered bus for O'Hare. And we arrive at Tel Aviv the next day. Tuesday, right? And now we are ready for the adventure of a lifetime. When you're watching the slides, um, note the clothing we're wearing. The pictures are a combination from our trip in March and in November. So it will be pretty similar. You can see the average temps for November. After arriving, uh, we plan to go to Joppa right on the Mediterranean Sea. And it's from here that Jonah flees from God's message to go to Nineveh. It's here that Peter was staying, tradition tells us, at that very location with Simon the Tanner. On the roof, remember, Peter has his vision of unclean foods, which God said you are to eat. Then it's on to our hotel for a good night's sleep right on the Mediterranean. Wednesday. It's on to Caesarea. This city is located 65 miles from Jerusalem. Herod the Great built this city in 12 years. The harbor uh, he built was an engineering feat. Right there is where Herod's lighthouse would have been located. This is where Herod's pool, his palace pool, was. The stadium that you see uh, has seating for 15,000, and they'd hold chariot races. This pillared area <clears throat> was Governor Pilate's headquarters. In fact, his name is found carved into a stone that was discovered there. Pilate housed 3,000 troops in this city. It's an important city. In Acts 10, Peter ministers the gospel to the Gentile centurion Cornelius and those in, with him in his house, and they all believe. In Acts 21, Philip the evangelist lived here, and Paul stayed with him and was warned about being taken captive in Jerusalem. In Acts 23, Paul is taken to stand trial before Governor Felix, and he's imprisoned there for two years right where that circle is. He then is on trial before Governor Festus and then King Agrippa. We'll see the 12-mile aqueduct that brought water in uh, to their city. Then it's on the Mount Carmel. Uh, it's 35 miles long. It's this mountain range rising 1,500 feet above the plain of Sharon. In Joshua chapter 12, the King of Carmel is listed with the other kings who were defeated by Israel. And we'll have a time of study right there, uh, seeing how Elijah defeated the prophets of Baal. And then we look out and we'll see the Valley of Jezreel. And uh, this is the northern portion, and it's called the Valley of Megiddo. And it's possibly there that the Battle of Armageddon will take place. Revelation 16. Over 200 battles have been fought in that region. In Joshua chapter 12, Megiddo is mentioned among the conquered kings by Israel. In Judges chapter 6, this is where the Midianites, the Malachites, and the other eastern peoples camped during the judgeship of Gideon. In 1 Kings 9, in the day of Solomon, this was part of his military network. 2 Chronicles 35. In that valley out that you see, a battle took place between the godly king of Judah, Josiah, and Pharaoh Necho of Egypt. This resulted in Josiah's death. The reign of Josiah was the last period of prosperity for Megiddo. 
we'll see the fantastic water system that we can explore if you desire to do the steps, but you don't have to. Cana. Well, this is a drive-by, but that's the place where Jesus conducted his first miracle, John chapter 2. But we will stop in Nazareth, and that's where Mary and Joseph were from. And then we spend three nights in a beautiful kibbutz right on the Sea of Galilee. Thursday, new day, we'll be on the Sea of Galilee. And that's amazing. We'll have a time of study on a really great boat. And uh, this will be a very, very special time. Capernaum is our next stop. This city is on the northeast shore of the Sea of Galilee, which served as Jesus' home base for his ministry. The many homes would be one room, perhaps divided by pillars that separated living and storage space. These homes would have been clustered around courtyards where they would have baked and cooked. This is Peter's hometown, as described in the Gospels, and it is a very important city. This might have been Peter's house. In the 4th century, a church was built around it, and now there's, a, as you will see, a very modern Roman Catholic church over it. On the plastered walls, where they discovered many inscriptions like bless, blessing the name of Jesus and asking for God's mercy. So at the least, it was a Christian's home, a home church, very likely. This is where Matthew ran his tax business. Peter and Andrew, John and James were fishermen in that area. It was the home of a high-ranking government official. In Matthew 8, in Luke 10, here a Roman centurion with his detachment lived long enough to build a relationship with the Jewish people as he built them a synagogue. Jesus heals his servant. Jesus would have taught in this synagogue, but below the present structure. Jesus condemns this city because of the people's refusal to repent and their pride and how they viewed themselves. In Matthew 9 and Mark 2, Jesus heals the paralytic, seeing the faith of those who brought him. Remember the story? They broke through the roof of the house to get the man to Jesus. So much happened in Capernaum. This beautiful picture is on the northeast side of the Sea of Galilee. You know, before going to Israel, I thought Sea of Galilee was so much bigger. It, it's not, you know. It's possible that the hillside here is where Jesus taught the Sermon on the Mount. Don't know for sure. We'll walk around the grounds there and uh, we'll study the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5-7. to seven. New day, Friday. It's up north to Caesarea Philippi. And this is where the tribe of Dan migrated, creating the northernmost boundary of the promised land. After Alexander the Great conquered the area, the Greeks who came in founded a shrine for the god Pan and called it Panius. According to pagan mythology, Pan was born in a nearby cave. Herod the Great, wanting to please Rome, built a temple to honor Emperor Augustus. Herod's son Philip enlarged the city and renamed it Caesarea Philippi to honor himself and to distinguish it from the port city that his father built down the coastline. In Matthew chapter 16, we have Peter's great confession. You remember? When he said, Jesus asked, who am I? And he said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And we'll study that passage right there in Caesarea Philippi. The Banis River that you see emerges from below the ruins. It originates from the snow of Mount Hermon. And it's one of the streams that forms the Jordan River. Well, then it's south to Bethsaida. And this was a great town of miracles by Jesus. In Mark 8, a man born blind uh, is healed. Peter and Andrew and Philip were from there. And Jesus cursed this town because, having seen miracles, they did not believe. The town was destroyed and lost, 
but then discovered in the 1980s. They unearthed a fisherman's house. They could tell by the artifacts. Also a winemaker's home. Also, this probably was the capital of the kingdom of Jeshur. David married the king's daughter, Ma'aka, Absalom's mother. And thus Absalom flees to this city to escape David's wrath. Hazor. This city is located in the allotted territory of the tribe of Naphtali. Population at its heights at its height was forty thousand, flourishing during the second millennium BC. And it would have been the western outpost of the Fertile Crescent. Well Joshua destroys this city. Joshua eleven says at that time Joshua turned back and captured Hazor and put its king to the sword. Hazor had become the lead, the head rather, of all these kingdoms. Everyone in it they put to the sword. They totally destroyed them, not sparing anything that breathed. And he burned up Hazor itself. Solomon then rebuilt the city, 120 feet above the valley, as a fortress to protect the northern entrance into Israel. According to 1 Kings 9, Solomon used forced labor to rebuild the city and several others. It was destroyed again in, 18, or in 885 B.C., uh, 1 Kings 15, by Ben-Hadad I. And it had a complex water system, which we can walk down again if we choose to do so. And you can see how they dug through it. There would have been many storehouses here for Solomon. The valley that you see was the highway to the world, north to Babylon and Damascus, west to Phoenicia and the Great Sea, south to Egypt. Well, Saturday comes, and it's on to the Jordan River. And we're going to have a time of baptism or rededication in the Jordan River if you would like to participate. If you've never been baptized as a believer or as an adult, this is a great opportunity. Or if you have been baptized as a believer, it could be, and for many it is, a rededication to Christ. Cost, I think it's $10. You get a robe to wear, a place to change, and a towel. Well, next we go to Gideon's spring. Its name is Harad, meaning brook of babbling. And I love this. This is the very spot where Gideon reduced his army when he would have stood against the Amalekites. And we will study that text. Then we explore the non-Jewish city of Beth Shan. And uh, the mound that you see is the older city. Uh, The mount is where King Solomon's body, after death in battle, was nailed to the wall. You see the arrow, and it's pointing to a On the other side of that mountain is the city of Jebish. And Saul saved that city. So Saul, after Saul's death, the men of Jebish raided Bashan to take down Saul's body. And they took it back to their city. Here we see their theater. Well, now it's on our way south to the Dead Sea. And we're going to explore En Gedi. It's beautiful. It's where David rugged. It's, it's where David hid himself from King Saul. In fact, in 1 Samuel 23, we read about David cutting off a corner of King Saul's robe, undetected, of course, in one of these caves. Driving further south, that's still the Dead Sea. And eventually, we enjoy playing in the, s- the salt water. It's amazing. And then we get to stay at a fantastic hotel resort for two nights. New day, Sunday. And we will explore Masada. Masada is a natural fortress in the eastern uh, Judean desert on the western shore of the Dead Sea. Herod built his fortress here as it was close to friendly neighbors. And he had a three-tier palace an extremist group of Jews who were kicked out of Jerusalem at the beginning of the revolt against Rome, 66 AD, they took refuge here. 
Jerusalem, we know, was defeated in 70 AD, and this was the last stronghold against Rome. At the end, the leaders told everyone to take their own lives rather than be taken by the Romans. 960 bodies were found. Two women and five children did not die. The Romans built an earthen ramp, you can see it, to get up the wall. And uh, there were Roman encampments all around the fortress. Well, we're going to have a Bedouin experience. We're going to have lunch in a tent. We're going to ride some camels as well. Then we come to Qumran. And this is where a Jewish sect lived. In one of those caves, the Dead Sea Scrolls were found back in 1947. And we'll take a time, we'll have a time of teaching on the accuracy of Scripture. Monday. It's on the way to Jerusalem. It's a long drive. We'll stop at Jerusalem uh, to visit a fantastic scale model of Jerusalem in the day of Christ and spend some time exploring the Shrine of the Book Museum. It was built as a repository for the first seven scrolls discovered at Qumran. And we can even look at a copy of the book of Isaiah that was discovered uh, from the Dead Sea Scrolls. Then it's on to our hotel in Jerusalem, four nights. Tuesday, we're going to visit the Temple Institute Museum, which is fascinating, and walk the Cardo. We will go to the Southern Gate. And uh, the stones that you see, the older stones, are original. First century, Jesus would have walked on them. And it's here that Peter and John, remember, healed the one who was crippled? Well, Lord willing, we'll get to drive into Philistine territory. And we'll go to Samson's hometown. And we can look out into that valley. And right across that valley is where Delilah was from. What a great perspective that we get to see. Then it's on to watch the battle between David, one of you will be David, and Goliath, one of you will be Goliath. And we will stand in the very stream which was dry when we were there, where David picked up his stones. The Philistines were camped to the right, Israel to the left. It's amazing. We're going to be right where this happened. Well, then it's back to Jerusalem. And we will go to the Temple Mount, and no talking is allowed. The steps, and you see the older steps there, are original to Herod's day. The mosque rules like no shorts, no upper arms can be seen, no touching the opposite sex. The wailing wall. People would put rolled up papers, or people do, uh, with written prayers, and they stuff them into the cracks. This wall uh, was knocked down by the Romans when they destroyed the temple. And uh, those are the actual stones from the temple that Jesus would have worshipped at. And this, again, is so amazing. The pavement there, that's first century stones that Jesus would have walked on. We'll see the original Jerusalem called the City of David. It's much, much smaller. Then for the brave of heart... And I finally did this, this last trip. We can walk underground into a tunnel that was built by Hezekiah. And uh, so the city could have water when it was under siege. We'll get to visit the discovered Pool of Siloam, John chapter 9. This is where the man born blind was healed by Jesus. And we'll study that text. Then we'll go to the very impacting, heart-wrenching, Holocaust Museum. Then we'll drive up to the Mount of Olives. And looking at Jerusalem across the Kidron Valley, Jesus was there on the Mount of Olives many times with his disciples. It's from here that the Lord ascends to heaven. Uh, It's here that Jesus will return, Zechariah 14, and we'll study that text. Then we walk down to Jerusalem from the Mount of Olives. 
And this would have been the very way that Jesus with his disciples would have walked. Then we come to the Garden of Gethsemane. This is where Jesus prayed and was arrested. Hopefully, we'll have again a, a private garden where we can study and sing and have time by ourselves to pray and meditate on what Jesus did for us in Jerusalem. We'll stand on this pavement, which may have been the very stones where Pilate sat in judgment on Jesus. This pavement is second century. So it's over the very road that Jesus would have walked on carrying his cross. This, or these, are streets, both of them, that Jesus would have walked along on his way to Calvary. This may well have been where Jesus was crucified, the place of the skull. It's not up on a mountain. It's on the street, it was the side of a street, where people could see Jesus and mock Jesus. That's where they put the criminals they crucified. And then we come to the garden tomb. You know, it's very possible this is his tomb, was his tomb, maybe not. We can go in it. And then we'll celebrate the Lord's Supper right there. That night, we will have a time of sharing together. Uh, our tour guide on four of my five trips was Miriam Vamos. And we're hoping she'll guide us again, but we don't know for sure. Um, Miriam has written a number of books that, uh, that are awesome. You know, you go into any of the souvenir shops or whatever, you'll see her books. Well, that's our plan. You know, if you're thinking about coming along Please uh, contact me, let me know. We will send you a brochure. Uh, all the details are here in this. And we'll be traveling with Friendship Tours, which is the only group that we have used. A great Christian man owns it, and they've been great to work with through all these years. There's plenty of time to start saving for that trip, as it's $3,979 if you pay by check, it's $179 more if you pay by credit card. All the details are in this brochure. Again, come pick it up at church or give us a call. We'll get it to you. The price excludes or doesn't include a few things like our daily lunches. And that's probably $12 to $20 a day. Of course, you're responsible for your own personal spending. And you might want to buy trip insurance. Uh, we do take a love offering at the end of our tour to give to our driver and our guide. Well, those who plan to go, uh, you're going to get a study guide. It's over 100 pages long. Uh, you'll find there's 18 studies that you can do on your own to help you prepare for this adventure. But you don't have to. On our trip, we've got 22 group studies. We might not get them all in at the various sites that we'll be at. Again, if you got questions, please email, text, or call me or the church office. If you're planning to come or just thinking about it, I'd like to know that so I can generate a list, and that helps me. Again, feel free to invite your friends, invite family members to join you and me on this adventure of a lifetime where God's Word will come alive.